Last week, we started a series called Identifying and Avoiding Spiritual Pitfalls. Identifying and Avoiding Spiritual Pitfalls. We're going to be looking throughout the entire Word of God to identify those spiritual pitfalls that various characters in the Bible encountered. But hopefully not just to identify them, but to avoid them. Amen? And last week we saw the first and greatest pitfall, and that's when Eve and Adam listened to the wrong voice. They listened to the wrong voice. Today, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 4, that we'll be looking at the second pitfall. Now, let me ask you a question. When you hear the name Cain and the name Abel, does that bring anything to mind? Have you ever heard those names before? All right, let, let's just out of our own minds, let's, let's talk about what we know about Cain and Abel. First of all, we know that they're who, who are their parents? Adam and Eve, that's right. Cain is the oldest of the sons and Abel is the second son. What else does the Word of God teach us? It teaches us that, that Abel was a keeper of the flock. He was a, a herdsman. But Cain, what was he? He was a farmer or a tiller of the ground. Something else we learn is that, that on one occasion they brought an offering to the Lord. You remember that? They brought their offering to the Lord. It says that Cain brought an offering from the fruit of the ground to the Lord. But it says that Abel brings the firstling of the flock and the fatling. The firstlings of the flock, that's the very first and the best and the fattest of them, okay? Brings it to the Lord. Now the next thing it says is that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But he did not have regard for the person Cain or his offering. Now what happens, how does Cain feel about that? Is he excited about that? No, what happens? It says in the Word of God, he becomes angry. And literally his countenance or his spirit fell. What's the next thing we find out about him or we remember about him? What does he do? He does what? He kills his brother Abel. Out in the field, he strikes him down, he kills him. And what does he do with him? He tries to hide him, probably, doesn't he? Don't you imagine? He's trying to hide him. And in regard to that, who shows up and asks him a question? God shows up and asks him a question, and he says, What? Where's your brother? Where's your brother? And then we know those famous words of, of Cain. What is it? What does he say? Am I what? Am I my brother's keeper? God goes on and tells him, I know what you've done. I know that you have killed your brother. And because of that, there is going to be judgment upon your life. Now, listen to this. In the midst of that story... There's some verses that, that we didn't point out and verses that most of the time, if we're thinking about that story, we never even consider. But there are two very important verses that identify the spiritual pitfall that Cain falls into. They're verses 6 and 7. So I want you to turn there in verses 6 and 7. And I want you to identify, and us to identify today, the spiritual pitfall. Listen now, write this down. The spiritual pitfall... Of rejecting an invitation. You hear that? There is a spiritual pitfall when you reject an invitation from God. God offers invitations to His people. And to reject that invitation is a spiritual pitfall. Listen to what happens in the midst of that story. Whenever Cain became angry because his offering was not accepted, in verse 6 it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Listen to verse 7. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? 
You need to underline these words, very important words. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. Do you hear those words of warning that God gave to Cain? He says, listen, you have an opportunity to get right. You have an opportunity to do well. If you do well and you get right, you're offering and you'll be accepted just like Abel was accepted. But you've got to understand the importance that you've got to do right. And if you do not do right, there are some things that are dangerous that you are going to face. Now, let's write down a few things about this invitation that God gives. First of all, it's an awesome privilege. You need to write this down. It is an awesome privilege that God would offer to us an invitation, right? God doesn't have to offer an invitation to us, but He is the one who offers invitations. Now, He's going to offer an invitation, for one, that you might have a relationship with Him. He'll offer an invitation that you can come and have a relationship with Him. He's the one who offers the invitation. Okay, He's the one who initiates that. I hope you don't think in your mind, well, I tell you what, I was searching out there, and one day I found God. No, God found you a lot sooner than you found Him. Amen? (laughs) And the very fact that you were searching for Him, the very fact that the longing of your heart is that you might have a relationship with Him, the fact that you would have even that desire is the fact that God offered to you an invitation. The invitation to have a relationship is an awesome privilege. God is the one who initiates it. Hold on a second. The second invitation is this. God will offer an invitation to get right when we're wrong in relationship to God. He offers an invitation. Listen, you're wrong. You're in sin. You're doing the wrong thing. But God says, but listen, if you'll come back, if you'll get right, I'll receive you. I'll forgive you. And we can reestablish that relationship. And my friend, God is the one who initiates that. Whenever we're away from God, whenever we've committed sin, when we're in that state of being removed from Him and closeness, it's God who comes back, just like He did to Cain. When Cain said, man, I'm angry at God, and I'm mad, and I'm upset, and my spirit is down, it wasn't Cain who went to God. God came to him and said, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Cain, listen, come to me. Come to me and and let me help you. Come to me and and let me minister to you. Come here. I want you and it will be well with you. Come home. Come home. It's God who initiates that with Cain and with you. Hold on a second. Remember, it's an awesome privilege that God offers an invitation. Whenever he comes and speaks to us when we've sinned and faltered and failed, that shows you just how much God loves us. Amen? If we were God, a lot of people would be in trouble. Amen? <laughs> you crossed me, you're done for. Uh, that's it. But not God. He's full of loving kindness and mercy, and thank God he is patient. Amen? He's patient with us. What a wonderful privilege God offers to us the invitation for relationship and and to get relationships right, okay? He offers that invitation. Now, here's the second truth that you need to know. To reject that invitation is a dangerous thing. To reject that invitation is a dangerous thing. Now, most of us don't consider that. We just don't consider that. We we don't consider what we do and what happens in the spiritual realm when we reject an invitation from God. But here, this passage reveals it. God tells Cain what takes place if he rejects that invitation he offers to him. Look what it says in verse 7. If you do well, will not your heart or your countenance be lifted up? Here it says, and if you do not do well... If you reject this invitation, 
If you won't let your heart be changed. Here's the first thing. He says, sin is crouching at the door. Number one, sin is crouching at the door. It takes sin and it personifies it. That word crouching is just like it would be a lion or a tiger that's sitting outside of the door. And if a person rejects the invitation to stay in the house, and they decide rather they want to go out of the house, instead of staying with God, they decide they want to go away from God, sitting right outside the door is a fierce lion or tiger who is waiting to pounce upon the one who rejects the invitation. You get that picture? Now, I say it's a personification of sin, but the reality of it is there is somebody behind that sin. There is a power that's working in sin. The old enemy who deceived Eve is also out there, and he is a roaring lion, and he is one who will pounce on you. Amen? Now, I, I hope you've got sense enough that if I told you, listen, when y'all leave today, there's a roaring lion right outside there. There's a lion outside that door. So you can go outside that door, and that lion is going to pounce on you. Or you can go outside this window over here, which is where I would go, and miss the lion. Amen? How many of you would go outside that door? I hope you got sense enough to say, there's no way. Some of you are saying, I see you macho men. I'd take on that lion. That's because he ain't sitting out there. If he were sitting out there, you wouldn't be wanting to go out there. But sin crouches at the door to pounce on you. It cannot pounce until you make the choice of what you are going to do. And if you choose to reject and go out the door, it will crouch and pounce upon you. Listen to what he goes on and says else. He says, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, at the, at the door and its desire is for you. Its desire is for you. Do you know what sin wants to do in your life? It wants to be master over your life. It wants to be Lord over your life. Sin wants to control you. Sin will control you. All you have to do is open up the door and sin will take charge. How does it take charge when you reject the invitation of God? Or see, to reject the invitation from God is to offer an invitation for sin. And he goes on and he tells him this, and you must master it. He says, you are the one who's going to make the choice. You're the one who has to make the decision. You're going to decide who's going to be master over you. Either God says to Cain, either me, or you're going to let sin be your master. And I'm here to tell you that's exactly what takes place. It's exactly what takes place. To reject the invitation of God is to choose that sin would control you. That the enemy might control you. Matter of fact, it gives the enemy legal standing. All right, you need to write that down. It gives the enemy legal standing. What do I mean by that? Well, if you and I say that we want God to be master over us or Jesus to be Lord over us, then that means we're supposed to be doing what he says, amen? If he's Lord and he says, come, we come. If he says, go, we go. We're doing whatever he tells us to do. So when he invites us and tells us to come and to get right with him, we ought to be coming and getting right with him. That's submissive, being submissive to his lordship, amen? But hold on a second. If we say, I'm not going to do it, even though you're lord of my life and you're master over my soul, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to make my own choice, and I'm going to go out the door. I'm going to reject that. Hold on a second. Then the old enemy and sin has a legal standing. Do you know what the old enemy goes up to God and says? He says, God, you know, you've been protecting these people. And you have all this power, and you've been protecting them and guarding them, and I can't touch them unless you allow me to touch them. And I understand that, but hold on, God. This child of yours, this one who says that you're Lord over their life, they have made the decision 
They have made the choice, not me. They made the choice to not let you be master over their life. They made the choice to reject your lordship. And now they have gone their way, and I ought to have the opportunity to have my way with them. I ought to have my opportunity to do what I will with them because they have rejected you. Do you see the danger of that position? See the danger of what you're deciding to do? An old devil comes up and says, I ought to have right. They rejected you. They don't want you to be Lord over their life. And I can tell you one thing. Jesus stands at the door of your heart and he knocks and he asks you to invite him in and let him be Lord over your life. But old Satan doesn't do that. Whenever Satan gets an open door or an opportunity, he will knock down everything, barge into everything, and take over whatever he can take over. He is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door and wants to master you. And the way he can master you is if you do not choose to let God be master of your life, if you do not choose to let the Lord be Lord over your life, then the old enemy and old sin will master you. It is a dangerous thing to reject the will and the plan and the invitation of God. Have, you, have any of you ever, ever met somebody that we call them that their hearts have become hardened? Spiritually, have you ever met somebody like that? In other words, early in your journey with them, they loved the Lord, they were sent to the Lord, they cared about things of God. But then down the road, their hearts become hardened. They're, they're not nearly as sensitive, they don't care about things, they're, they're fleshly in what they do, their choices are all... And you wonder what happened. You know what happened? What happened is that whenever they were invited by God to get right, when they were invited by God to repent, when they were invited by God like at Cain to make the right choice, they said, no. No, I'm not going to do that. And so they went on their own way, and old enemy is, and sin is crouching and fighting and mastering and changes their heart and changes their life. And hold on a second, you're not immune to that either. All you have to do is reject the invitation of God who invites you into relationship and back into fellowship. Amen? Third thing you need to write down about this invitation. Please do not take for granted that the invitation is always available. Do you get that? Do not, do not take that for granted. Many people do. Oh, well, I don't really want to get right right now. I don't really want to do that right now. I know I should. I understand it would be good for me. But I'm not going to do that right now. But, but down the road, I'm going to do that. At least before I die, I'm going to do that. Amen? We all want to get right, right before we die. Amen? Because we're going to stand before Almighty God. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're going to give an account for all of those days when you weren't walking with God. Amen? And you need to get right now, not down the road. But do not take for granted that there's always the opportunity. I don't have time to turn there, but read when you get home, Matthew 22. Matthew 22, it's Jesus teaching about the parable of the marriage feast. Remember what happens there? The king or the landowner prepares the feast... For his child, and this feast is going to happen, this marriage feast, and he invites people to come. When he invites them to come, they don't come. They're, they're, they're too busy to come. They got other things to do than come. And he invites them all. As a matter of fact, he sends out his messenger again to invite them, and he, they get so angry at the messengers, they kill the messengers. Do you know what that story goes on? It says, it says and the king sends forth his army and destroys that murderous generation. He destroys those who have rejected his invitation to come. And then he sends his servants out and says, Now, go invite anybody and everybody. In the highways and byways and wherever it might be, invite anybody who might come that I could have someone at the marriage feast of my child. And others came. Hold on a second. Those who rejected the invitation, 
Those who rejected the invitation were eventually going to be destroyed by that king, by that master, because they rejected the invitation to their child's wedding. Now, that seems pretty hard. Well, you mean, you mean God is going No, the point is this. There is a limited time of opportunity. After that limited time of opportunity, there won't be. Now, I don't know when that is. Don't come up to me and say, it's my time over. I don't, I don't know that. I, don't, I had a lady in, in a church that I passed in Brooklyn. She called me at 3 o'clock so many mornings in, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, 3 o'clock in the morning, all right? And her concern was she committed the unpardonable sin and she was going to hell and that she wouldn't be able to get saved. She's talking to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's the only time she ever called me. I didn't even know who she was. And, and I assured her, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. If you did, you wouldn't be caring about it. Amen? You wouldn't be caring. You wouldn't be concerned about that issue, about that point. Let me tell you what. She is concerned, hyper-concerned about it. But you need to realize something. That there is a limited time of when you have the opportunity to respond. And do not take for granted. You might say, that seems pretty harsh that God would judge such. Have you ever, have you heard any of these stories? And Remember that my child had uh, a situation like that with a, a classmate. I heard a story about that recently. Have you ever heard a story where a, a child would have a birthday party and would go to school and invite people to their, kids to their birthday party only for nobody to show up? Have you ever seen that experience happen? Invite people and they have the party planned and nobody shows up. What a heartbreak that would be. I want to ask you, if that happened to your child, how would you feel? Would you feel real loving, kind, full of joy and happiness? No, you wouldn't. You want to get somebody. Because why? Because it broke the heart of your child. You know God loves his son. He loves his son. His son died for you and me. And there is a limited time for that invitation for you to respond. Do not take for granted that opportunity. Now, second thing I want to share with you about it, in regard, that's just about the, the invitation. Second thing I want you to see is the results, the unexpected results. Remember what I told you? That the problem with sin is there's always unexpected results. The problem with pitfalls, there are unexpected results. I want to share the unexpected results that Cain faced because of what he did. Here's the first thing. He killed his brother. He killed his brother. When he did not accept God's invitation, master his own life, and allow his heart to be changed, he killed his brother. But you know the reality of that? Sin killed his brother. Sin is what killed his brother. Sin came over him, took control of him, and caused him to do something he would never, ever imagine doing. That he would kill his brother. Sin, if it is left unchecked, will cause you to do things you never thought you would do. You realize that? Here's the second thing. I told you this the last week about sin. Sin. Whenever he does that, he wants to hide it. He wants to hide his sin. When he kills his brother, he's hiding his brother. He puts it, says it, it's in the ground. The blood is in the ground. What's he going to do? Hide his brother. So nobody will know. Now, could you imagine going to supper that night? Where did Abel go? I don't, I don't know. Where is it? What happens to sin? Every time you sin, you want to hide it. You want to do it in secret. You don't want anybody else to find out about it. All right? And so he's trying to hide it. But, but one thing about God, he knows what? Where everything is and where everything's hidden. And so what he come to him and said, where is your brother? Where is your brother? He asked him that question because God knows where he is. And God eventually says, the ground that you have tilled, the ground that you have worked, it is crying forth. The blood of your brother is crying forth from that ground. I know what you have done. He was hiding, trying to hide his sin. The sad thing about him, it seems as though he wants to have no responsibility and no remorse. <laughs> no responsibility and no remorse. Here's the third thing. He becomes totally self-centered. Did y'all hear that? If you didn't get another thing today, write that down. 
Do you know the results of letting sin master your life? You become self-centered. Self-centered. That's for any of us. When sin rules your life, you are self-centered. You know how self-centered he was? This is how self-centered he was. Whenever he says this, he says, Am I my brother's keeper? In other words, am I responsible for my brother? I'm not interested in my brother. I'm not supposed to be looking out for my brother. But when God tells him, you're guilty, son, and he says this, because you're guilty, this is what it's going to cost you. You're no longer going to be able to till the ground. You're going to be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. You're never going to be able to settle down. You're going to be a vagrant and a wanderer on this earth. And do you know what he says? You know, he says, look at verse 13 of chapter 4. He says this, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. You see how self-centered he is? He doesn't care one thing about his brother. Am I my brother's keeper? But whenever the punishment comes down, and when the punishment's laid upon his life, you know what he says? This is too great for me to bear. Because you know why? The only person he thinks about is who? Is himself. Is himself. He's concerned about it. In fact, his brother's dead. He's concerned about the judgment that's going to happen in his life. You know what the, the fourth of those experiences is? It's the fact that he loses purpose and meaning in life. What was the thing that he had chosen to do? He, he wasn't a herdsman. He was what? A tiller of the ground. Where did he get his joy from? He got, he got his joy from working the ground, working the land. That's where he got his joy. And you know what God told him? God says this, because of your sin, because of what you have done, look at verse 11, you are cursed from the ground, which opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. In other words, you can plant all you want to, but the ground is never going to give you any fruit. The ground is never going to... What you got joy from, what you were able to produce, the meaning you had in your life, that is no longer going to happen. It will not yield any fruit for you. But that's not all. He says this, And you shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. You're never going to be able to settle down. You're going to be going from place to place. You can't stop and plant a garden and live off that garden. You're going to be living all over the place. You're going to be wandering in this, pla- in this world. You will have no place. You got another thing. That's what it says in verse 16, a result of that sin. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. You ought to underline that. And settled in the land of Nod, which is the land of wandering. He what? It says he went out from the presence of the Lord. That's one of the most dangerous things I've ever heard in my life. Most dreadful things I've ever heard. To be banished from the presence of the Lord only to live in a land of wandering. You know what the final result was? The final result that he established a city. He established that city in a land... And he began to flourish. Read the rest of that chapter. He began to flourish. Out of his offspring comes one who's a great musician. Out of his offspring comes one who's a worker of bronze and iron. It describes an affluent society. An affluent society that what? That is a godless society. Because he goes on and he talks about one of his grandchildren, great-grandchildren says this, that Cain killed his man, and he had this upon him. But I have killed two men. And he has no regret about it at all. A society that was affluent and godless. Living in a realm of godlessness. If you want to know where our society and where the society of the world came from, when you say, man, there's a fluent, fluency, but there's godlessness, it all started with Cain. He had no idea, no idea what his rejection of the invitation of God was going to cost him and cost the world. Now, very quickly, I want you to write these things down. I want to give them to you because I told you the most important part is not just identifying pitfalls, but how to avoid them. Here's the first thing. How do you avoid spiritual pitfalls? Here's the first one. Listen and respond to God's invitation. All right, whenever the Spirit of God quickens your heart, speaks to your heart, 
respond to his invitation. How many of us have been guilty that we've heard and been quickened by the Spirit of God to do nothing about it? Just to not respond at all. Say, I'll do it later. There'll be another time. Listen, don't do that. Listen to and respond to God's invitation. Why? It's a privilege that he invites you. Here's the second thing. Never assume that another one is coming. Never assume that that invitation is going to be offered out there and offered out. Now, some of you say, well, Brother Mac, I know he offered me one time and I didn't do it. He offered me a second time. That's wonderful. That's great. That's the mercy of God. But don't assume, don't assume that another invitation is coming. Because there is a limited amount of invitations and what finally God will say, that's the last one. So do not assume that an invitation is coming. Here's the third thing. Write this down. Remember that a choice to reject God's invitation opens the door to sin's influence and mastery. Now, I hope you'll get that in your mind. It is a very serious thing. Whenever you reject God's invitation, it's not nil and void. It opens up your life to an invitation for the mastery and control of the enemy and of sin. That is a serious, serious matter. So always accept the invitation of God. Always respond to the invitation of God. Here's the fourth thing. When you begin, listen now, when you begin to detect the traits of sinful influence. You hear what I said? When you begin to detect in your own heart the traits of sinful influence. But what is that? (laughs) Self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. Lack of remorse. And responsibility, loss of purpose and meaning and joy in your life. When you begin to detect that in your life, then repent and return. Amen? Did you hear what I said? You've got to be sensitive. When you begin to sense that 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 influence of sin is taking over and you're losing that quickening of the Spirit of God to you, repent. Say, God, I'm sorry. God, I don't want that to be in my life. God, I want to return to you. I want to return to you. You must be sensitive. If not, every time you reject it, every time you reject it, the harder your heart will become. Final thing. Please write this down. Please write this down. Do not let affluence fool you. Okay? Some people have the idea, well, you know, I must be all right with God. I mean, good things are happening to me. I have plenty of money. I got this nice house. I got this nice car. I mean, surely good things must be happening. God must be pleased with me. Do not let affluence fool you. Amen. For you can be affluent and godless simultaneously. You can be affluent and godless simultaneously. As a matter of fact, one of the lies of the enemy is to get you so affluent that you don't think you need God. To get you so affluent you think you're right with God. As a matter of fact, it's the grace of God sometimes that takes your affluency away and puts you in need so that you begin to look up for help. Amen? So please do not accept the fact that things are going right in your life and things are so wonderful and you're so blessed godlessness can coexist with affluency. The way that you know you're right is because you have the fruit of the Spirit of God in your life with a sensitive heart to hear the voice of God to say yes to Him, to respond to Him, and to walk with Him mastering your heart. That's how you know you're where you ought to be with God. Amen? Now, there is a pitfall. And it is a dangerous pitfall of rejecting an invitation from God. Don't do that. When you hear his voice, and you will hear his voice, say yes. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Yes, Lord, I'll respond. For there are great dangers when you reject it. Great dangers when you reject it. Remember, he loved you enough to invite you. What a privilege. Amen.